John in Character presents Hidden Heroes of History. Stories that make you wonder, Hey, how did I not know that? Featuring your historian in chief, Jonathan Cormer. Ahem. <clears throat> oh, uh, and his trusty hedgehog sidekick, Reginald T. Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> what you singing, Reg? <laughs> it sounds uh, so familiar. When the saints go marching in. All oh, right, that's the one. Famously recorded by Louis Armstrong and his orchestra. Indubitably. You know, Reg, Louis Armstrong means a lot to my family and me. Oh? Yeah, my grandfather was an amazing piano player and loved Dixieland jazz. He produced a big jazz festival with bands who came from many different countries. Ooh, from different countries? Yeah, from France, Germany, England, and even Siberia. Oh my! And every festival started with a parasol parade, where all the guests marched to that song you were just humming holding and twirling their elaborately decorated umbrellas for everyone to see. <sighs> it was pretty great. Ooh, how delightful. My parasol would have been the most spectacular of the bunch, adorned with the finest fringes, tassels, and sequins. You know, I, I bet you're right. So I imagine there were many fans of Mr. Armstrong at this festival. Oh, absolutely. He is truly beloved by jazz fans everywhere. You know, Jonathan, this has me thinking. I was going to propose that on today's show we talk about the greatest hero on this big, round earth. Oh, who's that? Why, me, of course. Oh, I could not be rolling my eyes any harder right now, Reg. However... I would instead like to discuss another truly amazing historical hero. <laughs> Louis Armstrong. Hmm. I like it. Well then, get on with the lesson. Let's have it. Oh, uh, I thought maybe since it was your suggestion that you'd help out a little more than usual with this one. I'm really more of a, a brilliant idea guy, Jonathan. You should know this by now. And besides, I don't know much of the details. That's your job. Right. Chop, chop. I want to hear more about the amazing Satchmo. Hey, you know his famous nickname. But of course I do. Alrighty then. Let's start from the beginning. Louis Armstrong was born in New Orleans in 1901. He lived in what was once a very dangerous neighborhood and had a very difficult childhood. In fact, he needed to start working when he was still pretty young. That is, however, how he came to afford his very first cornet. That's true, Reg. You kind of seem to know a lot about Louis Armstrong. <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, uh, I am quite the music expert, aren't I? Well, can you tell the listeners about the cornet? Absolutely! It is a... Uh, a... A... It's a... Uh, tubey, shiny, golden noisemaker of great power. Uh, yeah, sure. But also, it's a melodic brass instrument... Very similar to the trumpet. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, that's what I said. Back to the story. Mr. Armstrong was eventually mentored by the top cornetist in New Orleans, Joe King Oliver, or King Oliver for short. Ooh, a king, you say? It was just a nickname, Reg. Hmm. <laughs> well, over time, Mr. Armstrong became one of the most in-demand cornetists in town. He kicked off his career on Mississippi River boats, and in 1922, King Oliver asked him to join his orchestra in Chicago. The two of them together, with their spectacular cornet solos. I mean, they were truly the bee's knees. Now, I'm going to stop you right there. 
I've met many bees, and I dare say none of them had knees. The cat's pajamas. Cats don't wear pajamas. It's poppycock. The bullfrog's beard. Well, now I officially know you're losing it. Reg, those are all catchphrases from the 1920s. They just mean that Louis Armstrong and King Oliver were the best in town. Ah, I see. It's like when I say someone's the hedgehog's waistcoat. Sure. They were the uh, hedgehog's waistcoat. Anyway, in 1925, after playing and recording with King Oliver, and then spending a brief time playing in New York, he decided that he would go back to Chicago and start making records under his own name for the very first time. Ooh, frightening. What do you mean? Oh, deciding to put out your own creations? To play from your soul and put it into the world under your very own name? Oh, you know, you're right. That is an extremely brave thing for an artist to do. I'd call him a hero just for that. So he struck out on his own and... What happened? Did they like him? Did they really like him? Oh, you know... He just became one of the most influential jazz musicians of all time. Of all time? That's right. Over his long and storied career, he transformed jazz music. He really developed the art form in a way that still influences jazz musicians to this day, and has made sure of its lasting legacy. He also had a distinctive voice, was skilled at playing with melodies and improvising, and he helped popularize scat singing which, if I am not mistaken, is singing like your voice is an instrument, with no words? Well, yes, it was a totally improvised form of singing. I'm impressed, Reg. Eh, nothing new here. I am amazing. Louis Armstrong and his band, The Hot Five, later The Hot Seven, recorded hit songs for five decades. <gasps> Unbelievable! And that's not all. No? He wrote two autobiographies, ten magazine articles, hundreds of pages of a memoir, thousands of letters, my, my. He appeared in more than 30 films and made appearances on popular television shows, on film and TV too. He recorded everything, his time in the studio, when he was sitting around eating breakfast at home, song drafts, and even his favorite jokes. He had quite the sense of humor. A true entertainer. And at the height of his career, he was performing almost 300 concerts a year, with tours all over the world. He became Ambassador Satch. Oh, my head is reeling. But I've left out one very important aspect of his career. How could there be more? Mr. Armstrong broke down barriers during a time when there were even more significant obstacles for African-American people in our country than there are today. He was the first African-American person to write an autobiography, get cast in a major motion picture, and host a nationally sponsored radio show. He also famously spoke out about the Little Rock Nine. This was an incident in Arkansas where nine African-American students were prevented from attending school. Well, I'm glad he said something. No one should be prevented from learning or going to school. Absolutely, Reg. That is quite a lot of accomplishments for one man. He must have been a huge celebrity. He was, but one of the things I love most about his story is how almost normal he liked to be. Normal? Well, Louis Armstrong was so famous and was likely wealthy enough to live in a grand home, like a really magnificent mansion. Ah, now that is the life. But he didn't. What? Why not? Well, he really liked his home in the working-class neighborhood of Corona, Queens, where he lived with his wife Lucille for almost 30 years. And he had a great love for his surrounding community, a love that was given right back to him. Aww. Just one example of this is how the young kids in the neighborhood would come help him bring in his luggage and instruments when he returned after a long tour. How delightful. 
When he recorded his cover of What a Wonderful World, which is still one of his most popular recordings, he said, There's so much in Wonderful World that brings me back to my neighborhood where I live in Corona, New York. Ah, what a true passion for his neighbors. It is at that. He goes on to say that through living on the same block for years, he saw three generations of kids grow up there and come back to visit with their own children. And when he thought of their faces, it gave extra meaning to the part of the song where he sings, I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. It seemed so much of his life was about deep passion for music and using it to bring people together, to remind them of the wonderful world that's beyond their walls. Oh, drat, Jonathan. You've made old Reg tear up again. So many of these stories get me all emotional. That's pretty amazing, right? A man that built a music legacy and a legacy beyond music. He changed the course of jazz as an art form and had a real love for his community while he was at it. I just thought of something, Jonathan. Uh-oh. No, no, I think you'll like this one. All right, then. Shoot. Well, this episode has me thinking about how we talk about so many notable heroes who are, of course, very well deserving of the honorable title. Very true. But there are also lots of heroes in our everyday lives. Our own personal hidden heroes inside of us and around us. Hmm. Your grandfather also loved community and brought people together around his deep passion for music. Maybe that means that sometimes a hero can be a friend, a teacher, or even a grandparent. You know, Mr. Reg, that might be the most awesome thing you've ever said. Why, thank you. I mean, it is so hard to choose because I've said so many awesome things. And some things will never change. Thank you for telling me another fascinating story, Jonathan. And just think, there are even more heroes out there, right now, changing lives, accomplishing great feats, bringing us together through their incredible art. It's truly a wonderful world. A wonderful world indeed. Hidden Heroes of History is a John in Character production. This story was written by Molly Murphy and performed by Jonathan Cormer. Sound recording and production by Jermaine Hamilton at Studio Circle Recordings. For more information about today's hero, go to johnincharacter.com. Oh, and if our storytelling brings you some joy, and a few laughs, we'd be so grateful if you'd help us live happily ever after by writing a review. It's one of the best ways for others to find our geeky tales. But before you go, please hit the subscribe button so future episodes will automatically show up in your podcast library. Now, go be the hero of your own story, and we'll see you next Once Upon a Time.